sorry about that. So Luke chapter 8 and verse 22. Right, now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the wind and the water, and they obeyed him. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a very dramatic story. And if we can picture it in our mind, all of us have seen storms before. We may have not seen this particular lake, but you have seen waves, either pictures from the ocean or when you are by the seaside, or even on the little Lake Albert or whatever, you can see waves occasionally pick up. And so we can imagine some of these things in our mind, and uh, even just in the last week, there's been some interesting weather. I'm sure if you have experienced it too, sudden downpours, hail, uh, just crazy, crazy rain coming, um, and it's been good, but imagine this scene. Jesus is going to the other side of the lake, and he is in this boat with his twelve disciples, and they're traveling across, and remember who these disciples were. Several of them were fishermen, and they weren't just fishermen, they were fishermen on that lake. That Sea of Galilee, they were there all the time. They knew that lake. They knew where the winds might would normally come from. They knew how to sail from one side to the other, no problem. But then there came this storm of wind on the lake. Now it's interesting, it puts there it was a storm of wind. It wasn't a rainstorm. Those can be frightening. Uh, it wasn't a dangerous storm because of lightning or because there was a lot of water falling out of the sky. But this was a dangerous storm because the wind was blowing so roughly that they were getting filled with water. Their boat was completely filling up with water. Notice also in verse 23 it says, And they were in jeopardy. Their lives were at risk. This ship was going down. Surely, if it was a normal sailing day, the fishermen would have been able to make it across without any problem. And surely they had seen, you know, Peter and, and James and John, they had seen all kinds of weather on that lake. If they thought they were in jeopardy, then it was really, really really bad. And then they came to Jesus. Now we have to go back a little bit here and find that Jesus fell asleep on this boat. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat when it's calm and you're going somewhere and it's a little bit gentle, the rocking of it maybe, and it, it's easy to fall asleep. That's what I've found. Some people get seasick, but... Uh, it's, it's nice and calming. And Jesus was comfortable enough to go to sleep. Not sure if this says more about his trust of uh, his disciples taking him across in this boat, or if it says more about how busy he was and why he wanted to go across the lake this way. Because it gave him a chance to rest. Because he was continually being surrounded by people wanting to hear his words to be healed by him, to see miracles. And so this was actually a chance for Jesus to catch up a little bit on his rest. Well, he was asleep, and the disciples came to him. Now we're going to focus in a little bit more here on how 
they approached him. Notice it says they came to him. That's pretty bland. But then notice their words. They said, Master, Master, we perish. They weren't, they weren't um, calm and collected. They were worried for their lives. Master, Master, we perish. They were afraid. They were waking Jesus up, and they were afraid for their lives. They thought their lives were in jeopardy, and they were coming to Jesus, and they were extremely afraid. They came to the right person, and we'll see that later. They came to the right person, but their fear was not good. They should not have been so afraid. They have previously seen him do many miracles, including raising dead people and healing people and casting out demons. Surely someone who could do that could also keep them safe. But they were afraid. We see then Jesus' response. And it's interesting, when I wake up, I'm not generally all there, all together. But here, Jesus wakes up, and he immediately does what his disciples had asked in calming this weather. He rises up and rebukes the wind and the raging of the water. He just speaks to it. Jesus did not do any wizardry. He didn't have any techno technological gizmos to control the weather. I mean, today, we can't even predict the weather with all of our technological thingies. You know? You look at the weather app today, and it's going to tell you it's going to rain tomorrow, and then tomorrow it's going to tell you it's not going to rain, because it's not going to rain. So they can't get it right even from day to day. Um, but here, Jesus is able to just speak, and it affects the weather on a massive scale. Notice how much change there was. We had a storm that was of wind, and it was powerful, and it was filling the boat, and the ship was in jeopardy, so imagine waves are coming up high, okay? It's moving around, it's tossing everything around. You can't see the sky because the spray and the, and the waves are just flashing by everywhere. And here, Jesus stands up, and he just speaks. And immediately, the raging of the water ceases. It's like, goes flat. And immediately, the winds are ceased. They're not blowing, and there was a calm. That's pretty amazing. When the wind dies down, often it'll take a little bit for the waves to respond. You know, they've been moving the water around, and the water takes a bit to get flat. Here Jesus speaks and immediately the water responds and the wind responds as if it was cut off with a guillotine. Just no more storm. It's all gone. And the lake or the sea was calm. It was perfectly smooth and still. Jesus then turns to his disciples. And he says to them, where is your faith? Now, we're going to get back to that statement of Jesus. But I want us to see the disciples' reaction. Because really, Luke is trying to show us that too often, we and the disciples are looking at this world with eyes of fear. Here. He said, here's the, the disciples' response there in verse 25. It says, And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. You see, the disciples went from being afraid for their life, from this crazy storm that had come up, and from the water that was filling their boats, to... Fear of the one who could stop such a powerful and dangerous storm. They went from one fear to another. Their fear was just replaced, one fear with another. And Jesus' question is, 
Where is your faith? You see, the disciples shouldn't have been afraid. They should have been having faith. Even if Jesus hadn't been in the boat with them, they trusted that God, that is God the Father, was looking out for them, that he cared for them. They trusted and believed that God had something for them to do. They should have been trusting in God, but they were not. They were fearful for their lives. Instead of saying, well, if I'm going to do what I can, but if this is when God is going to take me home, that's the end of my life. They were afraid, and they were fearful. Now, I don't want you to think that um, it's unnatural to be afraid. It's very natural to be afraid. We learn uh, fear is a very good motivator, and it's a good teacher. Uh, I was thinking of the girls uh, just this last week. They were riding their bikes around. Um, and Sophia's got one with training wheels, and Susie's got a little balance bike. But they approached riding that bike with fear, and it was good. It kept them from falling over quite as many times. They were careful in going to do that new thing that they hadn't done as much before. Uh, fear can keep us safe. It can, it can teach us things. And it's very natural as humans to realize we're not invincible or all-powerful. And so there are things we can be afraid of. But at the same time, we have to move past fear to faith. Because if we do not have faith, we will just go from one fear to another fear. Each fear just leads to another. You know, we're afraid of dying, and then we're afraid of that thing that kept us safe from dying, and we're afraid of not having enough um, things in the future. What's the future going to hold? And then we're afraid of the answers that come, the possibilities. We're afraid to act. Fear will hold us back. Jesus says, where is your faith? It's interesting, Jesus nor Luke provide us the answer to that question. He wanted the disciples to think about that. Where is your faith? And I'm sure each one of them had to sit there and consider as they finished their journey to the other side of the uh, Sea of Galilee, where was my faith? My faith wasn't in God. It wasn't in Jesus. Where was my faith? We have a couple of options for where their faith were. Uh, what, where was it? Was their faith lost? Had they <clears throat> um, so forgotten faith that it was no longer present? I don't know that that's true. They definitely weren't approaching their situation with faith at that moment, but they probably hadn't forsaken all their faith. That brings us to the other options. Was their faith hidden? And I think this is true. Their faith was hidden. You know, your faith can be hidden behind your busyness. You're so busy that you have no time to have faith in anything because you're, you're not able to even focus on anything else but the, the task you're doing. Or maybe it's hidden by um, some goal that you have that has taken first place in your life and, and your faith has sort of taken a back seat to that other goal. <coughs> Maybe your faith has been hidden, as it was with the disciples, behind your fear. Your fear has made itself a bit bigger, and it's sort of hiding your faith. You still have some faith, but your fear holds you back. Maybe your faith is hidden. Or maybe your faith is in the wrong object. I'm sure the disciples, when they hopped in that boat, 
who were thinking to themselves, maybe not out loud, but they were thinking to themselves, this boat looks like it can hold all 12 of us, or all 13 of us, or however many there were, because we're not given a number. <laughs> however many were in that boat, and they were probably thinking, I trust that this boat is sufficient to get us across the other side. And they probably looked around and they said, oh look, Peter, he looks pretty strong. James and John, they know how to handle the oars and the sails. I think that with the manpower we've got, we can make it to the other side. And their trust or their faith was in the wrong object. It was in the boat or it was in the strength of their own arm. How often are we looking around ourselves and we're looking, we're saying, okay, yep, 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 yep. Oh, here's the things we need to get done and we can get it done because we have this much manpower. Or here's the things we want to see happen and the growth we want in our church and then COVID hits <laughs> and we're locked down and we're not able to meet and were we just looking around at our own strength, we're going to fail. We're going to find that our faith was hidden behind a trust in something other than God. The disciples came to Jesus. I don't think they came to him with much hope that he would be able to rescue them. When they come and say, Master, Master, we perish, you almost get the sense that they have given up hope and they are waking Jesus so that by chance they might be able to wash ashore with him. To wake him up so that he has a chance to survive this horrible storm as well. They are not coming to him expecting him to calm the waters. They are not expecting him to do anything miraculous. Their faith was not in him for this instance. And again, I'm not talking about salvation faith here um, with what they are doing. We're talking about just faith for doing everyday things. The disciples were trusting in their own strength and in the boat and in the good weather to get across the other side. But when things all went wrong, they went to Jesus, not for him to fix things, but because they thought he was also at risk. Jesus then showed them that their faith was in the wrong place. Their faith should have been in him. The final thing to uh, say is, if someone came up to you and said, where is something, you might think they had lost it, or that it was hidden, or that it was um, the wrong, they had gotten mistaken it for the wrong object. But also sometimes, when someone says, oh, where is your faith? They might be saying, do you have any? They might be saying, why is your faith so small? And I do think Jesus here is intending either that they had the wrong object or that their faith was so small and they needed to, you know, focus on it because it's really small. You gotta keep your eye on your faith if it's that small. Um, we're going to turn now to Matthew chapter 17, another familiar passage. Um, 17 verse 20 and Jesus said unto them because of your unbelief for verily I say unto you if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed ye shall say unto this mountain remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you a grain of mustard seed is it would be seen but it would be very easily hidden, lost, or just unnoticed, because it's small. It's not a big seed, it's not like a coconut, or something that's 
obvious and easy. It's something that you could easily brush off the table or, you know, walk over and not even realize you had stepped on it. A mustard seed is very small. And Jesus is saying that the disciples' faith was smaller than a grain of mustard seed. And he's like, if you even had that much, the size of a mustard seed, you'd be able to do so much more. We need to exercise our faith. Most of you here I know personally, and you have a testimony of salvation. You have professed that you have faith in Jesus for salvation. But do you know what? Faith is not something that you can just ignore. If you do, it'll get smaller and smaller and disappear. It'll get hidden, forgotten, swept away. Instead, faith is something we need to exercise. As you can tell by looking at me, I'm a big advocate of exercise. No, I'm not really. <laughs> it's, it's good that we get exercise sometimes, and we should be more. Um, but exercising your faith is necessary. If you do not, then you will find yourself in the same place with the disciples. You'll be on a ship. Your, your life will seem to be just falling apart. And you will see no hope. You will see that there's no way out. All the things that you trusted in, eventually they'll fail you. Whether it's your eyesight or your strength or your length of life. You expect, oh, I've got another 20, 30, 40, 50 years to go. Eventually that's going to run out. And generally faster than you hope. <laughs> Before you even notice, it's running out your time. Whatever it is that you're trusting in, that is not going to be enough. Unless you're exercising your faith in God day after day after day. And when you see a new situation, you aren't saying, okay, let me count the things I've got to help me get through this. Let me check that I have enough physical manpower to make this boat go across the lake or the sea. Instead, you count that Jesus is in the boat with you, and that with him, you're going to make it to the other side, or you're going to be home with him, and it's going to be glorious. That's how you exercise your faith, day after day. Yes, we do need to put the effort in. Yes, we do have to physically mow the yard out the front, but we also need to exercise our faith in God while we're doing it. We need to ask him to give us the strength. Ask him to bring across our path the people that need to hear the message. Ask him to meet with us in our prayers and in our devotions every day. We need to consider our plans and say, even if everything goes wrong, God's got my back. God's going to help me. We need to consider our plans and say, this is what I'd like to do, but what, have, what does God want me to do? Sometimes those things are not the same. Sometimes God has to change us and change what we want, so we'll want what he wants. Where is your faith? This question I want to ring in your ears. Where is your faith? Jesus called out to the disciples with just that one Statement, where is your faith? And the answer is, the disciples, their faith was gone. It was hidden, it was small, it was in the wrong objects, and they were consumed with fear. But Jesus calls us to have faith in him. He wants us to trust him. He trusted the disciples and the fact that God wouldn't let anything to happen to him, and he laid down and slept in the boat. The disciples had no faith. What will happen in your life if you begin to trust Jesus in every aspect of your life, from your health, to your job, to uh, your witnessing, 
to how you raise your kids, all of those kinds of things, all the day-to-day -day things, what kinds of things can God do? Well, he can do some pretty amazing things. Jesus can take the windstorm and he can cut it off completely. <laughs> He can take the waves that are high and they can go from being high to being flat immediately. Instead of just diminishing a little bit, they can go completely smooth. Jesus can take that mountain that seems to be in our way and remove it and cast it into the midst of the sea. And it'll be gone forever. You know, you can take the biggest mountain on earth and you can easily dump it it into the ocean in certain spots and it would disappear completely. God wants to take those mountains that are blocking you from serving Him, from trusting Him, and He wants to take them away. All you need to do is have a little faith in Jesus. That little mustard seed faith, tiny faith. Just that little bit. Trust that God can do the impossible in your life. Now, I'm not saying everything is going to be easy or good. We all know what happened to the disciples after Jesus uh, died, how they were persecuted and chased. They were put into prison, beaten, um, and many of them died serving Jesus. I'm not saying your life will be easy or smooth, but I'm saying that your life will be a value and worth eternal value if you will have faith in Jesus. It's not enough to get saved. That's the important first step. You need to have faith every day. Grow that faith. Make sure your faith is centered in the only one who matters, Jesus Christ. And do call him master, as the disciples did. They might not have had the right attitude. They might have been afraid, but at least they recognized that Jesus was the master. Look to Jesus. Point to him. Say, Jesus, you are my master. I want to do what you want me to do. I'm going to give you all of my effort, all of my time, and I want to see what wonderful things you will do. Because really, that's the two options here. If Jesus does something in your life, either your faith will have been in him all along, and you will be awed and praising that he has done such wonderful things through you. Or, like the disciples, you will be wondering and afraid, saying, what manner of God do I serve? That he can do such things. And so I ask you today, where is your faith? Is your faith in the things you see? Or is it in a Savior who cares for you? Is your faith small? Is your faith hidden? We need to be careful that fear does not block our faith. We need to be careful that fear doesn't take over. You know, there's a difference between being cautious and being afraid. And here, fear took the disciples and it, well, it would have destroyed them. But faith, faith would have rescued them. We can be, we can be very confident in God and we can trust His mercy because He does not cast us away even though we fail to have faith. Uh, the disciples here didn't have faith, and Jesus had mercy on them. He rescued them. The disciples didn't understand that their faith was missing, and all he did was gently encourage them, ask them, where is your faith? And try and build faith in his disciples. And Jesus wants to do that with you. He wants you to have more faith today than you did yesterday. He wants you to trust him more than the day when you were saved. He wants you to have a more abundant and full life that is full of riches in heaven today than you did yesterday. Will you 
work on your faith? Will you work on your faith? Or will fear or other things steal your faith away that you will have to be asked by Jesus, where is your faith? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word and his power. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you cared for the disciples and that you uh, worked with them even when they were um, untrusting of you, even when they did not recognize that you had all power and that you were worthy of all glory. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would work in our hearts. Help us to see and to keep a focus on the faith that we have. Help us to have faith in you, Lord, that we are not focused on uh, faith alone, but faith only in you. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would help us to have faith in every aspect of our lives, not just for salvation. And Lord Jesus, we love you. Amen.